Thank you everyone for joining the second interactive meeting. My name is Nolan. Uh, I run this meeting every month with two gentlemen, Bill and Rob, who are currently doing other things this evening. So it's just me kind of uh, keeping the ship heading forward this month, if you will. Uh, we meet here in my Zoom room, the third Wednesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. California time. It's always free, it's always open to everybody. The topic will be something to do with web and mobile development, although the specific technology we discuss will change from month to month. Uh, we are always looking for new topic ideas. If there's something you'd like to see a presentation on, please let me know. Uh, we're also always looking for speakers. If there's a talk you'd like to give, please let me know. Just send me a chat in the Zoom, that'll work great. Uh, there is no such thing as a talk that is too beginner or too advanced. If you wanna give an intro to how the new version of Bootstrap works, Great. If you found some crazy new JavaScript framework that you think is advanced but does some really cool stuff, you want to show that off, also great. Anything in between those worlds, uh, we'd love to have you be part of the group and give us ideas or present talks and, and do whatever you want to do. Uh, and on that note, Corbin is here this month. He's uh, spoken for us several times over the years, for which we are very appreciative. And tonight, Corbin's going to give us a look at what happens underneath the hood when you're using Git to control source control for your applications. Uh, so thank you, Nolan, for having me. Uh, so he is totally right that like, this is one of my favorite places to give a talk to. Nolan's always super great about making sure everything's organized. So let him know. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna be diving a little bit in depth on Git. Um, oh, I was uh, disabled the screen sharing. So. Awesome. You should be all set, sir. Sounds good. So. I will give fair warning. This talk does get pretty advanced. Um, please feel free to ask questions in chat. I'm going to make sure to have chat open on the side here so that I can be watching. Um, well, do I'll keep an eye on that for you too, Corbin. Perfect, perfect. Um, so yeah, let's start talking about Git. So, it, oh, actually, wait, let's start by talking about numbers first because numbers are kind of the foundation of a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. So I promise that this is gonna seem super tangential and it kinda is, but it's also like prerequisite that I think is important. So decimals, right? Decimals are awesome. We, 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 we write numbers in the decimal system, right? They're zero through nine, right? If you want to make a number, it has to be constructed out of one of these symbols, right? So 10 is a combination of one and zero a one in the tens column and a zero in the ones column, right? Um, I wrote about this uh, a little bit in like non-decimal numbers in tech. So it, th this is gonna be a very high level quick review. Um, but if you do wanna learn more, that link should help you out a little bit. Um, hexadecimal, on the other hand, you may have heard of it in like CSS colors or something like that, right? Um, hexadecimal is base 16, right? So not only does it have zero through nine, it also has A through F to represent numbers. So for example, A is 11, F is 16, right? So instead of a one and a tens column, we have a one and a sixteens column and it goes on further to 256, et cetera, et cetera, right? So one A would not just be one A, it's actually seven or um, uh, 27, right? Because it's 11 plus 16, right? Now, that number goes up, but it can also go down, right? There's also binary, which has ones and zeros. That's it. That's how our computer talks, right? Or like the, the, the data that our computer understands, right? So here, one zero isn't actually 10. It's representing the number, the concept of two items, right? And these are all different symbols to represent the same thing, right? So in, in decimal, five zero is 50, right? But in hexadecimal, three two is also 50. They represent the same number, the same concept of what 50 of a thing is, but they're represented with a different like system, basically, right? Uh, so values are the same, symbols are different. We're going to run into a few instances later on, especially with hexadecimal, uh, where the data has been written in order to display for the computer, but it's going to show up as garbled numbers and weird stuff, right? And that's because when a computer tries to show us numbers, occasionally it will try to automatically convert to ASCII or Unicode or some type of text encoding where a number represents a letter, right? So kind of keep that in the back of your thoughts as we actually begin the real talk, right? The get behind the scenes talk, right? This is, this is what we all came here for. So, 
Uh, first of all, who am I? I'm Corbin Crutchley. I'm the CTO of OceanBit. Uh, we do developer tooling, and of that, uh, we make GitShark, which is an open source mobile Git GUI, right? So if you've used GitHub for desktop, if you use Git Fork, some of the alternatives, um, it's that, but for your phone for now. Uh, and it works. It, it, I've used it like on my tablets to write articles on the go and push them to my blog that's hosted on GitHub. It's, it's neat. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? Um, it was a little bit on our, our meeting overview, but uh, we're going to be talking about what the .git folder is and what's in it, uh, how Git tracks and manages data internally. We're actually going to go deep enough that we're reading byte code, which is going to be interesting. Um, and we're also going to be talking about what happens during common operations. So if you've ever cloned a project and wondered what's happening under the hood, we're going to cover that. Uh, and then finally, as like a really like, okay, now you understand the internals, here's what you do with it. We're gonna explain how to recover potential data loss in Git, which is like a big deal because if you've had data loss in Git, there's a problem and you may have just lost months and months of work. So let's get started. So the Git folder is what contains all of your repositories information, right? So if you have a repository, like our, our Git Sharp project, and you ls the files and you show all the hidden files, it's going to include a folder called .git that isn't tracked. And that's because that is your Git repository, right? Everything else kind of builds around this folder. Now, this folder contains information, right? Uh, and contains different subfolders, different files. So uh, of them, there's hooks, there's index, there's head, there's refs, there's objects, and then there's a few others, right? Um, so there are more, but these are kind of like the big main one. And we're going to touch on every single one of these today. Let's, excuse me, let's start with hooks, right? So if you've ever ran like a, a git commit in a big project that's set up by, by others, um, or even by yourself, maybe, um, you may like run into like, oh, your, your tests need to pass before you can make a commit, or your linting needs to succeed before you can commit, something like that, right? That's a git hook. Git hook allows you to run code or a script of some kind uh, before every before specific steps in an operation, right? So pre-commit says, hey, before we actually make the commit, once we know what we want to commit, let's go ahead and run an action. Or a commit message might let you uh, lint a commit message so that it follows a certain standard so you can auto-generate change blocks, right? Um, and under, uh, so for example, here, right, uh, our change, our uh, commit message is literally just a, an sh file, right, a shell script that runs yarn commit lint and verifies the input, right? Um, and because of that, it's when we, I try to make a commit message that doesn't follow that pattern that commit lint has set up, it warns me and it prevents the commit from going through unless if I pass no verify, right? So I can pass no verify to get around that, um, but by default, it, it would block me, right? So under the hood, there, it, it's really just that simple, right? There are shell scripts. They can run not just with shell scripts. They can run with Python or Node.js, basically anything that supports a shebang, um, which kind of tells your shell interpreter which program to run. Um, and then it passes in STN arguments, right? So uh, if you've ever written uh, like a CLI tool and you've had to parse arguments, this, this is where that comes into play, right? So Git passes you arguments that you need to then validate. Um, and that's it. You can pass a one or a zero to do different effects. And there's lots of documentation for it. And that's Git hooks. So now we understand Git hooks a little bit better, which is kind of like a still like a very surface level thing. Uh, there's a few number of people that know how to like edit Git hooks and utilize them in your project. We're going to start getting like subterranean. We're going to start dealing with like the stuff that is usually very, very hidden in a project with Git, right? Um, so there's index files, right? Now, index file itself isn't modified very much, but you're modifying your Git fi index file every single time you run a command like git add or git remove. What it is, is it's your staging area, right? So you know how you need to stage files and then like if you run git status, it'll be like, you have X, Y, Z, blah, 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 right? This is the index file. That's what actually runs that show. Um, it contains uh, a helper command called git ls files to be able to show what is in that index file, right? So here we can see that there's three files tracked in reality, there's a lot more. I'm just cutting it so you can see. Uh, and then uh, it contains metadata for the files, right? It doesn't store the files themselves, but it basically says like, hey, we are tracking these files in our, our uh, staging area. And when we make a commit, we expect these files to be there at the end, right? Um, but you'll notice if we run head, which is kind of like cat, like we're reading the, the binary data, like, what is this? What is Dirk smiley face, smiley face? Like, what is that? 
So I mentioned hex before. This is where it comes into play, right? This is what is known as binary data, right? Sometimes our computer writes stuff that we are not meant to like realistically read without a, like a computer interpreting back and forth. Uh, and this is one of those instances, right? So uh, you can see the hex code represented right here as a table, and you can see what it is decoded to, aka what the computer thinks it is trying to say in human readable format, right? So let's go through it. The file contents of an index include three different things. They include a header, which includes metadata about like, like which version of the index file it is, or you know, like Git has a few different things. Uh, it includes the number of entries. So I am tracking 400 some odd files, right? Uh, it contains the file entries. Well, the entries themselves, I should say it that way. Uh, it contains metadata, uh, actually is file entries, uh, contains metadata, contains the file tracks, um, like doesn't contain the file contents, important to keep in mind, uh, but it can't track folders. Um, there's not really a reason it can't, uh, they just said that they haven't, right? So if you've ever had an empty folder you wanted to add to a Git project, you've had to have like a .git keep file or something like that, right? This is why, it's just because the index file doesn't know how to handle them. And then finally, at the very end of the file, there's a footer that's just a checksum and, and that's it. Right. So if we look, uh, we can see the DIRC stands for directory cache. It basically just says like, hey, Git, I am the file you're, you're thinking an index file should be. Then it's followed by a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is a 32-bit, uh, I think, unsigned uh, number. Right. And that just basically means it's version two of the index file. Uh, so Git has only had two iterations of what the index format should look like, this version two. And then it contains the number of entries, right? So here it shows a weird O thing, right? But that's not that's not what we're like actually trying to read. We're trying to read 00001F2. And if we try to decode that, we can run a command I wrote called hex to decimal. And if we pass in 0001F2, it translates to 498. Right? That is the number of files that is tracked within this index. So if we run git ls files, which shows like what is currently being tracked in the index file, and then we count how many instances there is, there's 498, right? So this number 01F2 is actually encoded to the value that is the number of entries, right? So this is what an entry looks like in hex. I have no idea what that means without like some kind of reference. So let's add one. So in the entry for like, and this is for every single entry, there's multiple of them, right? Uh, there is different metadata about the file. There's CNAME, there's MNAME, there's DEV, there's what is all of this, right? Uh, and the answer is that there are stats about the files themselves, right? Again, they don't track the contents, but they contain like the date it was last modified, M time, or the date it was created, C time, or like the object ID so you can go look up the file contents, which we'll get to later. It also contains the size, it contains, you know, like any data that isn't just the contents is reflected here. So let's take a look at one example, right? So if we read out the end time and C time, they're stored uh, in Unix time uh, stamps. So it's like number of seconds since July or January 1st, 1970, I believe. Uh, and if we take the first few numbers, right? So 5E6BA606, right? and we convert that to a decimal number, we'll see that that number aligns perfectly with the outputted data that we got from our CLI. The reason for that, uh, that we're not using the last four is because the last four are like much, much, much more specific. They're like literally nanoseconds uh, on top of this. So it, it's just a little bit easier to, to read out this way. And the same thing for end time. If we were to just take the hex code for 5E6BA6, so on and so forth, the first four would align perfectly with that C time. And in fact, the numbers are exactly the same between the two, so we can see that they line up, right? Uh, so the, the thing I didn't show is the footer, um, and that's just the, the SHA sum of the full file contents. So we've touched on the index file, right? Let's talk about the head file now. Uh, the head file is a little bit simpler, at least in terms of like outputting. Uh, if you cat the file's contents, it just shows ref, it just shows a string, right? So this file tracks what's currently checked out, uh, you update it whenever you run checkout. So like git checkout main, git checkout dash b, new branch, whatever. And it's going to update to, to show a new ref. But like, what's a ref, right? So a ref can be one of three things. And they're tracked within the refs folder within .git. A ref can be a head, which is a branch. It can be uh, a remote, which is like a remote branch. It's, it's it, well, I'll get there. Uh, or it can be a, a tag, 
right? So a tag is like a pointer to another commit or a pointer to something else, which again, we'll touch on later. Uh, a remote is remote branches, right? So if you have a remote database, say hosted on GitHub or GitLab or anything like that, uh, those remotes track what is on the server. Uh, and then heads is local branches to your machines. Now, if we go cat one of those refs, what are, what are all these? There's like a bunch of numbers and they're, they're, they're what, like, what, what is that, right? It's an object ID. So in particular, if we go look up this 92 something something 2C, we'll actually see that it's a commit object. Uh, so a commit object contains information like the tree, which is like a, fo uh, a folder of like what's being tracked. Uh, a parent, which is like the parent commit. If it's the top commit, it just won't have a parent field. Uh, if it's, or the author and committer, which can be two different things, but usually they're the same depending on how your project is set up. And then finally the commit message. So there's not just one type of object though, right? There's not just the commit object. There's also tree objects, which we touched on is a field here, right? We'll touch on trees in a second because uh, it's like a, a, a tree of files that are contained. It's not necessarily a folder, but it can be used to represent one. Uh, there's blob, which is the file contents itself. And then there's tags, which are named rest, which we touched on a little bit, right? So if we take a look at uh, the objects folder, we can see that there's a whole list of folders, right? There's zero, one, there's, they're all two digits, right? Which is a little weird, except for info and pack, which we'll touch on later. But if we look at like one of those folders, like one eight, there's FAE, blah, blah, blah. Kind of confusing, right? It's again, part of that ID. So an object ID is the first two characters merged of the, that folder merged with the rest of the file name in the ID. So this is one eight FC nine F zero seven. That's one object ID. And all of these object IDs that are in this folder start with 18, right? And that object ID is generated from the SHA sum of the contents of the file, right? So uh, if you have a file that says hi and you have a file that says hello, uh, it's going to SHA them and it's going to display them. Now, they're compressed with zlib, right? Meaning that if we cat the file, even a normal text file, it has like it's generated all sorts of odd, odd output, right? And again, that's because it's encoded with zlib. So if we use the inflate command, which is written by uh, Billy, uh, we can inflate and run the commit. It'll show uh, like the commit and the parent and all this other information that we wanted to see before, right? And then finally, if we run that inflation through the SHA sum again, we can see that 92609 something something 72C is exactly the same as all of the contents of the deflated SHA sum. It matches perfectly. So let's talk a little bit more about commit objects, right? So we were able to inflate them before, and it shows uh, the commit, which is like, like it shows this weird thing where it's like commit 248 tree and then the rest of it, right? That's because most objects start with the object type in case this isn't a commit object because there's four different type of objects that are all stored in the same file system. And then there's the size. So how long should we expect to read uninflated? And then finally, give us the data, right? So once we remove those tops, it's just the tree parent blah, 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 that we had seen previously, right? Uh, and then that contains the file tree and everything else we talked about. So tree objects are, as I mentioned before, a way of storing multiple different files within a list, right? They're created usually during git commit. Uh, so when you commit something and then, uh, you know, it's actually, Yes, tree objects are created on git commit. So when you like git add something, a tree object isn't created, but once you commit something, it'll go ahead and go, okay, we need to store all of these files inside of a snapshot and then include them in the commit. Apologies for that. Uh, they contain both a list of files, but also a list of other trees. And the way that they do that is by they is that they include metadata on them, right? So the name of the tree that it, the, the directory that the tree represents uh, or the name of the file that the blob represents. Uh, but again, the tree does not contain file contents. So if, oh no, um, hmm. okay, hang on, we're going to do this by hand. Uh, I thought I had to address that. So if we try to cat the file, we're left with some confusing nonsense, right? Like, what is that? And the answer should, oh, geez, Louise. Okay, hang on, we got this. Uh, 
blah, blah, blah. Nope, we're too far. There we go. All right. So it's okay though that that like output is something that we've seen before, right? So if we look at it inside of our hex editor, we can see that just like before, it shows tree and it shows the size of the file, right? That we would expect to read once uninflated. And then we can see the entry that we saw before, right? So one of those entries was the blob for buck config, right? So here we can see the same uh, 10644, which is the like git file mode. Git file mode kind of is similar to Unix file modes if you're familiar with those. Um, but the only difference is that it only has three different options, which is symbolic link file and uh, an executed, uh, executable file. I always get thrown off with exec versus execute. Uh, and then, Right as soon as one of them ends, you can see where I have my cursor on the other one. That's the end of the second file, right? So it contains all the information that we need to track. So blob objects, we mentioned that trees do not contain the file contents. So where are they stored? And the answer is blob objects, right? So blob objects aren't just created at git commit, they're created at git add. So if you run git add and then change your mind and unstage it and remove it from the, the index file, but then you run git add again, it actually creates two different blobs in your local folder that are, are only one of them is tracked within that commit, right? Uh, it also contains binary information, but it does not contain the metadata. So given a blob object, you can't, without looking elsewhere, figure out what the name of the file that originally contained these contents were. So if we look at a blob internal file and we just inflate it, right? So we uncompress it. We can see the commit type which, or the object type, which we talked about before, which is blob. We can see the size of the inflated contents, which is 966. And then we can see the contents. So this was a string file uh, and be, or plain text file. And as a result, now we can see the output in plain text. Um, but if it was say a binary file, a PNG file or something, right? It would output the raw, the raw data. So uh, for example, oh, this video isn't gonna play, right? Okay, hang on, I've had backups. I am prepared as much as one can be. So uh, pretend you don't see me talking. I definitely didn't record this before. So here, if we create a brand new folder, right? Like brand new and we run git init, there's going to be a git folder that's created. And inside of that git folder, there's no objects currently, right? Because remember they're created during git add, which we haven't done yet. So let's go ahead and create a new file. We're gonna call it hello.txt. Inside of hello.txt, we can verify the content, show what we would expect to see. And now when we run git add and git commit, we should see a blob file or a blob uh, object, a commit object and a tree object because we've created all three of them. So now let's go ahead and create a second file. Again, we're going to update hello.txt. We're going to make sure that the contents have updated as we expect. We're going to get add, which will create another blob object. And then we're going to commit, which will create another tree and commit object. We can verify this by lsing inside of .git. And now we can see that there are six different folders. Uh, and if any of them are the same, like we can log all of them. So here we can see that there are three from the first commit and three from the second commit, right? So something to keep in mind is that when we ran git add again uh, and created a second commit, there were multiple blobs that were created, right? I mentioned that blob commit, uh, sorry, that blob objects are created during git add. Well, that's true. And they don't get compressed until significantly later, which again, we'll touch on. So by default, when you git add multiple times, it stores the full file repeatedly, right? So let's say that we have a file called uh, my file and it's just one megabyte, right? And we git add, we commit, and then we make literally a single character change and then commit it again. We can see that there's now not just one file that's one megabyte, there's two of them. And as a result, the full file, the full size of the objects folder is now two megabytes. So something to keep in mind is that this can be a problem for very large files, right? So you have, uh, I mean, you should be using it like git LFS or something, but you could theoretically have a hundred megabyte file that you've get added twice by accident. And now your Git folder is 200 megabytes despite not using both. So just something to keep in mind. Now, this is where Git GC comes into play, right? 
because why are we storing like isn't git a, a versioning file system right why do we need two full objects if all that has changed is maybe a single byte of data for that character right so git gc comes into play when you have multiple different objects uh, and you want to compress them into a single place right so uh, let's take a look at that really quick uh, it's helpful hang on Videos just do not work properly at all. Here we go in uh, Google Drive. So here we can see that we have multiple different objects, right? And if we run uh, the, the file size and we sort, we can see that it's 60 kilobytes. Now let's run git gc. And now if we look at the file size of objects again, we can see that instead of six different folders, there's one folder called pack. And that pack folder is now only 12 kilobytes with an eight kilobyte info file, right? So this is run automatically behind the scenes, uh, very occasionally, like when you run occasional operations like git add or whatever, if git notices that your folder has expanded to a certain size, it'll go, oh, okay, I'm gonna go clean up, we'll be right back. Um, and the file that is generated at the end is called a pack file, right? So if we talk about a pack file, uh, it contains multiple objects in one, um, it's not compressed with zlib, but the files inside of the pack file are, or the objects uh, inside are. So if we had multiple different blobs, they're still going to be zlib uh, compressed, just like before they were packed. Um, and then the pack file also has an associated idx file, which is the index file. Uh, and it allows you to have like a, a cache of what is inside of the pack file, right? Okay, I know to go look for this object all the way down here, but it doesn't contain most of the, the object information that the actual pack file does. Um, and the way that it's in, wait, the way that is introduced is uh, the file savings is by the concept of a delta. So when you get check out a pack file, it'll automatically uncompress. But when you run git gc, it'll pack them back up. And the way that it does that is somewhat similar to a text diff, like how git usually keeps track of differences. Uh, although it's really important to remember that the way that deltas are stored are on a binary level. So this is more of like a really vague concept. Someone got mad at me like for giving this talk and like using text diffs as an example. But like diffing is really hard to explain anyways. So pretend that this makes sense. Uh, and basically you can see what has changed, like what has been removed, what has been added. Uh, and then the pack file only stores one version of the file and you're able to reconstruct all the other versions by adding in the differences, right? Now, most people would assume, or at least I would have assumed, uh, that when a pack file is generated, it chooses the oldest version of the file to store as like the, the de facto, this is the file right? This is the file contents, but it's actually not true. It contains the most recent version of the uh, object, sorry, not file. Uh, and then all of the differences going back in time are stored rather than the other way around, right? And deltas are really interesting uh, alongside pack files because they can live in harmony, right? Like you can have pack files and object files. Uh, so something that is inside of a pack file is packed, uh, but then something that isn't in a pack file is called a loose object, right? So if you run git gc uh, during some loose files, like you do like a commit and three new objects are created, right? But then git gc is ran again, then it will only be one file, which is interesting and a good way of saving space. Now, Git pack files aren't just a way of saving storage. They're also how Git decides to do their network operations, right? So anytime you make a push or a fetch or a clone or anything like that, uh, anytime that you interact with the network, in order to save on like HTTP requests, because making like 10 or thousands of HTTP requests is super, super expensive. Instead, it brings them into a pack file, which is maybe one or two files, and then it ships that down the pipeline, both directions for send and receive. Right. So we can actually demonstrate this. So given a clone, right? Is this sort of the right, yes. Given a clone, if we then look at our folder that was just cloned and we look inside the dot git folder, we can see that like there's all of there, like there's not any loose objects. There's only two pack files. And then everything has just been checked out which has been like unloading the, the blobs from the pack file into storage, right? But let's do this manually, right? So let's go ahead and run uh, a new folder. We'll run git init. And instead of cloning, uh, let's make sure that our git folder is empty, 
right? So there's nothing inside the pack. There's nothing, no loose objects. Let's add a remote called origin and we'll paste in our link. And now if we look at Git, we can verify there's still nothing in there, right? There's no objects. So now let's, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the things that is updated, however, is the config file, which we'll talk about in just a second. And this config file keeps track of which remotes you want to track and the URLs associated with them and which refs need to be updated when you like make a fetch. Now, when we run a git fetch, we can see our .git file is, there's no like checked out files, it's just the .git folder. And now we can see that all of our refs have been created, pack files have been downloaded, there's still no loose objects and there's still no local files. So in order to create the local files, we're gonna run a git checkout. Yeah, anytime. So now when we run a git checkout on main, we can see that all of the files have been generated, right? So the pack files contain all the contents and they're shipped down the network pipe, but it isn't until you do a checkout that the objects are extracted, well, extracted, uh, and then you're able to use those contents, right? So we, we like, that's it. Like that's how Git clone works. We just ran a Git clone by ourselves using fetch and checkout, right? That's all a, a clone really is under the hood. Uh, a config file, which we talked about during that video uh, is not zlib compressed, it's just plain text. Uh, there's not like too much optimization that's needed and there are very good reasons to update the config file manually. It contains uh, repository settings. So for example, like we want the file mode to be a specific thing or, you know, like there's there's different settings that Git allows you to configure. It contains uh, information about remotes, right? So, hey, we want to go, when, when I say Git fetch so-and-so, it's gonna go grab from this server. And then finally it has the information about tracked branches, right? So when I do Git checkout and Git push, we should go look here and do this and find this ref and so on and so forth, right? So I promised y'all recovery, right? We understand a lot about how Git works under the hood. We know that when we make like a commit, uh, it'll update the, and I apologize, I, I need to mention this really quickly because I think I had forgotten to. Uh, when you make a commit, it generates a new object, right? And then once that object is updated, it goes and updates the ref in here. Actually, I think I might be about to talk, to, talk about that soon in my slides, it's been a minute. So, like I had mentioned, every time that you update a ref with a commit, right, to a branch or to a remote or whatnot, right, remotes are updated during uh, pushes and fetches, right, uh, you can see the log folder contain like tracks that, right? So if you look at the refs, uh, you can see the ID and then you make a commit and then uh, you try to see that there are two different files, right, or two different commits, right? You made an accidental commit. Uh, you can then reset, right? You can say, oh no, roll me back. Right, but let's say during that I didn't make to make this commit commit, you actually add a very important file that took you a long time to write. Is that content gone? Right, like I've overwritten it using git reset hard. That's kind of my fault, right? Luckily, Git has a way to track once you've updated a ref. It'll also go right to a log folder, right? So if we look at logs, uh, we can see cat logs ref uh, heads main, and we can see that we cloned it, which created the original branch. We made a commit that updated that branch, and then we reset. But maybe the data is still gone? Well, it's not, because once we have made that commit, the objects aren't deleted when we reset. They're simply just not tracked anymore, right? Like Git simply says, hey, this information shouldn't be part of our branch. Go get rid of it, right? It's not tracked but the files are still there. The objects are still there that you can go get checkout. So if you made that mistake, then later you can run your log command and you can just say, get checkout this commit that isn't present anymore and merge your changes back in, right? Uh, so the command to do that is called git ref log, right? So if I run git ref log, we can see the same log as before, but in a little bit of a prettier format, right? We can see that it was uh, cloned, we made the commit we didn't mean to, and then we reset, right? Uh, and we usually it shows the, uh, the head log, um, but we can select a different ref. So for example, uh, instead of just showing like what we've changed uh, on our local commit, we can show what has been changed on the origin, say during a push, right? Uh, and unreachable objects are like 
what we were talking about, like not being tracked, right? There, the, the idea here is that like you've made a mistake and you've accidentally severed the line between that objects, those objects, the commit object or the tree object or whatever, uh, and like your main line branches and everything else that get, Git considers like, like mainline. And the way it considers it mainline is whether it's reachable by a ref or not, right? So if you've made that accidental mistake, you've, you've reverted that commit and now that commit isn't included in a ref anywhere, it's called an unreachable object, right? And you have to be careful and you have to kind of move somewhat quickly because Git GC will prune these objects. They'll get rid of them eventually from your file system, right? If they're two weeks or older. So for example, we talked earlier about Git add uh, generating uh, uh, like new objects each time. Well, those objects aren't tracked, right? They're not in a ref, they're not in a commit, they're not in a tree, right? So as a result, if you run git add twice, it'll create an unreachable object. One of those uh, blob objects just isn't utilized anymore, right? Um, you can also do this with our, our uh, squash merge or rebase. You can, you can potentially lose data with a few different operations, right? Um, so it's just something to be cognizant of, right? Like if we ran a uh, git add and then we ran a second git add later, one of those is not included in the commit and it's therefore unreachable, right? And the way that you can look for uh, unreachable objects is something called git fsck, right? So let's say that logs got nuked, right? Like they, they're gone, obliterated. You can use git fsck to still find references uh, to objects that have been severed, right? So by default, git fsck does not show anything in logs, right? So if I run git fsck, it's like, oh, no, we're all good. Everything is accounted for. And it's like, well, kind of, but it's not. Don't nuke logs, by the way. It's important. Go check logs first, then fsck if you need to. So if we remove logs and then we rerun git fsck, we can see that there is a dangling commit uh, and that it's here, right? So dangling commits is uh, a, like a subset, a superset of unreachable objects, right? So unreachable objects, they just aren't reachable by ref, right? But maybe, you know, like in this example, the, the commit references the tree, which references the blob, right? So even though they're unreachable, some of those are tied to other like objects. So if you post one into another ref suddenly, like say you check it out or merge it or whatever, right? Then those files are not dangling or are not unreachable anymore, right? So because of that, there's a distinction between uh, dangling, which can be very beneficial, uh, that allows you to see everything uh, that isn't referenced by anything else, basically, right? Uh, so then once you find a dangling commit, you can go, oh, okay, that's the commit I didn't mean to delete during my rebase. Let's go and grab it and grab the file contents. So, so just to talk about recovery really quickly before we end off. Video is playing. I'm probably talking in the background. So here, if we do a git ref log, we can see that we've made a lot of changes to this main branch, right? Which I, I mean, to be fair, I've updated it a lot. I've I've worked a lot on git shark, right? So here, if we run, do the thing. <laughs> It's always such a fun difference between recorded and live. The difference is that this is the much longer version of the talk with way more details. There we go. So if we run git fsck, even though there are things in our log, you can see that there's a lot that's dangling, right? So I haven't, like maybe I've made a commit or I'm, I'm a huge fan of rebasing for some instances. And when you do that, you do leave dangling commits kind of all over the place, right? So if I just made a commit recently, uh, then, you know, that's that. So if I run git prune and then I run git fsck again, all of those objects are gone, right? Git gc runs git prune other, under the hood to get rid of dangling objects, right? Uh, and then if I look inside of the objects folder, we can see that there's a lot of like unloose file, loose objects, right? But then if we run git gc and we take a look at the objects folder again, we can see that all of those loose objects have been packed into a pack file at the very end. Right. So that has been a look into Git internals. Uh, I want to give a huge thank you to William Hilton uh, and to James Coglin 
Um, both of them have like the, the James's book is incredible and really helped me implement a lot of the functionality that I needed to and really understand like the deep dives into Git's like file system stuff. Um, and Billy has been absolutely instrumental, literally like helping coach and guide me and, and even writing some dependencies that Git Shark leaned on early on. Um, so huge, huge thank you to both of them. So in terms of Git Shark and Ocean Bit, you can find us at, at Ocean Bit um, on both Twitter and GitHub. Uh, we have gitshark.dev, which is our website. And then I also stream a lot of stuff like this, like both talks and working on Gitshark. I built all of it on stream. Um, not all of it, but like 90% of it. You can go find me on Twitch at Crutchcorn. Yeah. Thank you so much, Corbin. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. If anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or unmute your microphone. And yeah. we don't have too big of a crowd here if you just want to Shout out your question. Uh, that's fine too. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, how do you, do you upload files to GitHub then? So that's where like our refs come into play, right? So Git is a very loose, like, like it's a standard, right? So GitHub is just like an implementation of a Git server, right? So I had mentioned a uh, Git clone, right? Which is how you pull data from GitHub off. Uh, but the same thing happens in reverse effectively too, right? So under the hood, when you make a push, you make a commit and then you run git push and it pushes off. So let's like walk through the process, like, like actually here, let's not theoretically walk through the process. Really walk through the process. Let's I already have a folder called test. Of course I, <laughs> okay, do it live, there we go. That's the wrong folder. Okay. So we have a new folder. I promise there's nothing in here, but don't believe me. Check it for yourself. Really? There's, there's nothing in here, right? So now let's run a git in it. We're going to look inside the .git folder. Let me actually expand this a little bit. So let's look inside the .git folder. We can see there's nothing inside of objects, right? Mm -hmm. So if we create a new file, uh, get at it and we look in objects, we've created a new one, right? Now when we run a commit, we see that's there too. So I'm not gonna add a remote just because I don't wanna like have to deal with adding a GitHub uh, thing on live because that's how credentials get leaked very easily. Uh, but what would happen under the hood, mm -hmm. we do git pack, uh, is it git pack? I don't know if there's actually a command. Actually, I think I just did it. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. Let's run git gc to force a pack anyways. So it would basically create a, a pack file, right? So now if I look in pack, we can see a new pack file, right? Uh, and then once it's packed up, it would then send it over fetch to GitHub's Git server and then store it, right? I, I don't know how GitHub works under the hood because obviously they're, they're a private company, right? Uh, but then later, if you wanted to update your file's contents, you would run git fetch, which would go grab a pack file from GitHub, pull it, and then store the pack file in your local like dot objects pack folder. And then if you did a git checkout, it would then go look at your pack file, make all of the objects loose, and then pull your file contents into your working directory. And by working directory, I just mean like the, the local file system that you use that's outside of .git, like the, the folder above. So if, if you want to update your GitHub file, you have to use um, slash pack, right? No. you So, so I will give heads up. 90% of what we talked about in this talk is like internal, right? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you shouldn't be having to modify any of these unless if something has gone really, really wrong, right? Uh, so this is more like a, a really in-depth look into Git. Um, there's like, uh, I would recommend like looking into, I don't know what like a, a great resource for like learning, um, like Git pushing. Right? Um, there is actually GitHub has some good docs on this, it seems like. So basically the idea would be from like a, a, a like, higher level API, what that process would look like is like you created a file, you git add, and then you git commit. And then inside that git commit, you now have a log, right? So we only made one commit, but you can have more. 
And then when you're ready to push to GitHub, you run git push, right? Um, it add a remote so it doesn't work. But if you ran a git clone and then a git commit git push, it would then go to GitHub. So, yeah. That makes sense. Any other questions from anyone? I had a quick question if I could. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm trying to uh, set up something where uh, I guess it would be a hook on the server side where if I do a push uh, into uh, a dev directory, I don't have to go into the other directory that also references that same repo and do a pull. Um, it'll just automatically detect a change and um, run a pull automatically. Because right now I'm kind of having a duplicate uh, work every time I make a change. I have to do a, um, I have to add, commit, push up to uh, to one re repo and then the other place where it's the other server where it's referencing, I oh. got to do a pull down from there, <clears throat> gotcha. if that makes sense. Yeah. So those actually don't tend, to, so, so that would be using a different process than Git hooks, right? Git hooks are meant more as like a, a client and they're only operated when you run a Git operation like that interacts with the file system, right? But what you might be looking for, like are you using GitHub by any chance? Uh, we're actually using Bitbucket right now. No worries, no worries. Okay. Jira and Bitbucket, yeah. Yeah. So Bitbucket, I'm almost certain, has a webhook integration very similar. Most most like server implementations of Git have something like webhooks, right? So webhooks are a way to track changes that have happened on a server side that then you can make operations on. So kind of similar to Git hooks, but with a server implementation um, that uses like REST APIs and stuff instead. Right. So what you could theoretically do is you could write a REST API using like Express or something, right? And then your Atlassian instance, your, your Bitbucket instance, when it notices a push that it receives, it can then go make a REST call to your server, which will then go and run a file system operation on that server. Uh, kind of like a, a, the process you're calling it, uh, uh, that you're describing is called continuous integration. Mm -hmm. Continuous deployment, which is CD. Um, it's also very commonly associated with continuous integration, which is like where CI CD comes from. Oh, look, that's an Atlassian article. Perfect. Um, and the concept behind CI CD is, is basically what you're talking about. When you make a Git push, you want to go grab from the server, from the newest Git instance, and make a deployment of some kind, right? Of the server, of the client, what front end, whatever, right? Um, and it, there's like kind of like this whole world of CI CD. Uh, that that is utilizable, right? So, for example, for Ocean Bit for Gitrick in particular, this is actually a little bit broken. Uh, it, you didn't see any of that. I definitely didn't see any of that. Uh, inside of there, uh, you can see that I have an uh, a, a command called CI that tries to build a script, and it's broken right now for very complicated reasons. Um, but ideally, like once a, a CI build is run, it can then send you like an email if it fails. In fact, I get emails all the time because this fails and I just need to fix it. Uh, and yeah, so there, there's a lot that, that you can do in terms of like, um, uh, what is it called? Process efficiency. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any uh, more I'll, questions for anyone? I'll actually make a, a plug really quickly. So I uh, I talk about programming a lot, uh, not just with talks, but I, like I also just am a, a like rampant nerd who doesn't have any free time outside of like programming. Uh, and I run a, a programming community and blog called Unicorn Utterances. Um, and in that community, uh, we also have a Discord. So if anyone does use Discord, you can totally, absolutely join us. I do weekly office hours for a couple hours uh, every Tuesday and whenever people ask usually. Um, and those are places where you can absolutely ask any question. There's no question too simple or anything like that. And we can like walk through and explain stuff. And it's not just me to be fair. There's a lot of folks in this community that are super, super cool, super helpful. So. Corbin, you've um, mentioned a little bit about uh, Git Shark during the talk to you. Do you want yeah. to give a real quick plug and show people what Git Shark is? Sure. Yeah. So it might uh, be relevant to the talk. Yeah. So Git Shark is uh, our tool that allows us to be able to track 
uh, like files, but track them visually. I can't believe that I still haven't fixed that font issue. So help me, me. Uh, <laughs> um, I promise I'm a better programmer at most things than this. This is bad and sloppy. Uh, but the idea is right. Like you have a list of repositories. And assuming you don't want to sit there and write, see, because, you know, on your phone or on your tablet or whatever, it's just annoying to type out every command. And even I don't memorize most commands, right? Like I tried to type in git pack five seconds ago, and that's not a command at all. Um, so git has a very broad API that's very frustrating to use. And occasionally because of that, a lot of people, including myself, like to use GUIs, right? Um, it'll tell you what you need to push and pull. Um, it'll show you what your history is, uh, what was made in a change in a commit. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's of course got dark mode. It's a dev tool. Come on now. Uh, but you know, like it has like one click integration where you click and it signs you into GitHub and like, that's all it does. That's all you need. Um, and it's open source. So if you don't like paying for stuff, which I totally get it. I've been there. I have a hundred percent been there. Uh, then you can go grab the source code and you can compile it yourself, or you can make pull requests if you want to see a change or, you know, like, um, so yeah, we, we try to make that process very easy. Now we're only showing phones on our website, but we also support tablets and maybe one day desktop. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, um, so I have a question. So do you think some of the websites that we see every day uses GitHub to store their data files? Could you repeat? Sorry. So do, do some websites that we see every day uses GitHub mm. to store data files? Gotcha. So it depends on what you're asking. And I'm going to answer it in three different ways because I'm, I'm a senior engineer and that's like the it depends answer is what every senior engineer says to everything. So I'm sorry. Um, but so like, let's take, I don't think any of my websites are hosted there anymore. Actually is, are we live? Uh, are we deep? Are we releasing today? Is that still live? Yes, it is. Okay. It's a meme website that I created ages ago for as a joke. So let's say it's a website like this, right? Where it's literally just like a couple lines of HTML. There's, there's more complicated things you can do. What you can do is inside of GitHub, there's something called GitHub Pages. GitHub Pages kind of lets you host a website is then hosted with GitHub. You don't have to find another like Netlify or you know you don't have to host a, a, an Apache instance or anything like that, right? GitHub kind of just handles that. Um, and yeah, some websites use it, especially like open source packages. Um, as far as I know, most big websites don't tend to use GitHub pages um, because the uptime is not guaranteed. Like, like to maintain a website to be on and active as often as you need a website to be, um, you need a very large set of organization, like you need a lot that goes into it, right? Um, and GitHub pages just isn't really meant for that, right? So um, it's not a good idea to use GitHub in, in, in order to maintain a website? Well, so it depends, right? I would say uh, the scale depends, right? So for example, this is a really bad website that I literally wrote in five minutes to send to my boss as a joke it basically just says every weekend don't release, right? Uh, and that's it. That's that's the whole thing. That's fine, right? Or even something like Plop.js, right? Plop.js is, is a library that I maintain, um, and it like this is fine. This this would be. I think this probably gets a couple thousand of you. You know, even unicorn utterances. We don't host there, but you could absolutely host a website of this size on GitHub Pages, no problem. Um, but if you're hosting like a, a big company, right, um, or you're expecting um, like like a ton of traffic that you need, you know, like that causes sales to happen or stuff. Um, I wouldn't tend to recommend GitHub pages um, just because the, the amount of control you have is very limited. That said, there's also another way to interpret your question, right? Do big companies host code on GitHub, right? So like not, not just websites, but like source code. And the answer there is, abs oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. I mean, Microsoft, bought GitHub, right? Like, like they probably host a ton of their stuff there. TypeScript is hosted there, which I know is open source, but I'm almost certain like Teams is probably hosted there, you know. Um, so big projects absolutely can use GitHub to host their Git uh, repositories. Um, and even if they don't directly host Git repositories, like Plop.js, right? Plop.js is used by TikTok. It's used by Microsoft and by PayPal and by all these other companies, right? 
So even if they don't host their code directly, they're using a library that is hosted on GitHub, right? Um, so I, I would say in terms of like repository management, oh yeah, GitHub's like the, the top dog in terms of like reliability and maintainability, right? Um, not that others aren't. I mean, to be fair, GitLab and, and uh, Bitbucket and some of the others are also great for reliability. It's just kind of GitHub's the big one, right? Um, but in terms of like website management uh, or hosting in particular, I think it depends on the scale. Medium, small, yes. Anything bigger, no. So. Um, because the reason why I'm interested of like how Git works because of GitHub, I have stumbled in that website for many times because currently I'm a student and one of our own lessons is, is to get files and then I kind of downloaded files from GitHub. Right, right. Uh, and I think that that's a different instance. Um, so I... A lot of what we chatted about today is very like very advanced, like deep level Git stuff. Um, and I promise that Git, like using Git on a day to day, is nowhere near as complicated as we just made it sound today. I promise. Like like I'm dealing with like the weird like like we're we're going like into Hades basement basically. Um, so. There are better, like easier ways to walk through Git um, and like how to use it. Um, and GitHub is very useful for hosting files, but there is a difference between hosting a file and hosting a website um, that is somewhat outside the scope of like this talk, but you are more than welcome to join our Discord and send us a message um, and we can try to help however we can, um, including like pair programming or, or, you know, stuff like that, so. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Going once, going twice. I think we've got everyone perfectly satisfied with all the wonders of Git and all the oh, under the hood awesome. magic that you showed off. Thank you very much, Corbin. That Anytime. was amazing. Always wonderful to have you as a speaker, my friend. Appreciate you, you being here and put all this hard work together for us. Always glad to be here. So thanks for having me. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, as I mentioned before, we do the talk uh, every third Wednesday of the month here in the Zoom room. However, we're taking December off because the date is just too close to all the holidays to try to schedule something. Uh, but shoot us a message on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that if you have ideas for other talks. And we will be back here in January. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming and hanging out. Cor and Corbin, thank you very much. This was fantastic. Awesome. Thank you all. Cool. Bye.